Okay, I guess I'll just get, get us started so we can really dive into this. It should be an hour, an hour 30 minute event, so we don't want to keep people waiting. My name is James Yeku. Thank you all for being here. I am an assistant professor in the Department of African and African American Studies here at KU. And I'm so excited to be having yet another DH, African DH panel, which in a sense explores the digital afterlives of the famous Onitra market literary tradition. Just to give some background context, the Onitra market literary pamphlets are integral tests of African popular literature, which cover a body of stories, plays, didactic discourses, and other publications that were produced by local presses in 1960s on nature in Eastern Nigeria. These important popular works emerged as symbolic expressions of the immense social and economic change taking place in the years before and after political independence from, from British rule. The Onitra pamphlets promote our understanding of the modernizing dynamics of the period and have remained central to research in African popular cultures with emphasis particularly on questions of gender and current culture. So this event is moderated by Dr. Liz McGonagall, who alongside former University of Kansas librarian Ken Lawrence, worked on digitizing the first collection of the pamphlets at the KU Spencer Library. Ken is joined today by two other librarians and a scholar of African popular culture, Professor Nokome Okome. I believe they all have the sufficient knowledge to speak both to the cultural and digital value of the nature pamphlets. And it's my delight to now turn things over to Liz, who will give us a sense of logistics and get us on the way. Thank you, Liz. Okay, thank you so much, James. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be moderating this panel, and I want to thank the Department of African African-American Studies for being a, a co-sponsor, along with the Kansas African Studies Center, of which I'm the director, and the Institute for Digital Research and the Humanities at KU. And thank you to all of our panelists for being here this morning. We're gonna hear from our speakers um, in the following order. Each will talk for about eight to 10 minutes and I'll ask them to just give a brief introduction of themselves um, when they begin their presentations. Um, so we'll start off with Dr. Ono Okome from the University of Alberta, who's a scholar of African popular culture. And he'll talk, speak to the importance of this genre. Then we'll hear from Ken Lorenz of KU Libraries who worked, as James said, with me to um, collaborate on the initial plan to digitize some materials and he'll speak to the creation of, of the collection itself. We'll hear from Elspeth Healy after that from KU Libraries. She'll speak more about the digitization effort and you know what we can do moving forward, I hope. And then finally, um, Daniel Rebison from the University of Florida Libraries will talk about the Nietzsche collection there. So after each panelist um, is finished with their remarks, we'll have time for Q&A and we'll look forward to hearing uh, your, your questions. Um, let's see, I think you'll be able to put them in the Q&A feature um, as well as possibly in the chat if that's enabled. Is that right, James? Okay. Great. Okay, so let's get started with um, Dr. Ono Okome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here. Um, it's a huge topic. Um, and so when James asked me to do this, uh, I wondered if I could in 10 minutes um, do justice to the idea of niche market literature. But let me, let me set the stage for you to understand how I got here and what I think uh, the whole process of digitalization of this um, pamphlet pamphlets will do for the study of not just for the study of African literature, but for the study of post-colonial literature, because this the distinction is very, very important. And I'll get, I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. My first encounter with Onitra Market literature start, was started a long time um, when I was growing up in my little town in the Niger Delta, a small town called Sapele in the Niger Delta, uh, which is about 200 kilometers from Onitsha, the city itself, where these pamphlets were produced in the 50s and the 1960s. Um, my father used to travel to Onitsha as he went about his business. And he often came back with really wonderful stories about this place called Onitsha, you know, where 
according to him, human beings and spirit commute and they speak to each other from time to time. We became fascinated with this city. But it was not until a couple of years later, just growing up, um, that I encountered the first real deal with this pamphlet theorem tradition. And that was when my older brother uh, brought a copy of Mabel the Sweet Honey that poured away and did everything possible for me not to read that pamphlet. And because he tried to prevent me from reading the pamphlet, I became interested. I made sure that I read it. I won't tell you the story of how I felt after reading that pamphlet, but it was both hilarious and something else. When I came for my job talk at the University of, of, of uh, Alberta, I knew I got the job when the then head, the chair of the department called me and said, you know, we have a wonderful collection of the Onitsha Market pamphlets in our special collections library. And I said, what do you mean? I said, yes. Do you, want, do you want to see this collection? And I said, yes. And I was stunned when I was taken to the vaults, you know, the, the basement of the, of the library, Rutherford Library. And I was made to wear gloves in order to read this pamphlet. That was stunning to me because these were things that we took for granted growing up. It was really, really stunning. Uh, and I said, so how did you get this? And then a long history that was given the history of how the acquisition of this pamphlet came to be. Since then, I've been interested and I've written quite uh, um, extensively about this pamphlet. Actually, the first idea, uh, was to work on the pamphlets. But because there was, when I was doing my PhD at the University of Ibadan, but because there was nowhere in Nigeria, and indeed Africa, where we could find these pamphlets, I decided then to work on theater to cinema. Uh, and then I worked on that and later came back to working on Nollywood films and, and became one of the first scholars to do so uh, in Nigeria. The other thing, of course, uh, the reason why we, we, we didn't take uh, the pamphlet seriously in Nigeria at the time was because we had a very traditional conservative kind of university system, which was modeled strictly along British lines. So, you know, according to like Longinus, the pamphlets won't fit into that category at all. It's, it's Shakespeare, it's Gaty and all of this. Uh, but but I was interested in this, so I began studying this on my own. I, I When I did my postdoc at the University of Bayreuth, again, I encountered uh, some really interesting pamphlets there in the, in the library, as well as uh, 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 in, in, in many other African studies departments uh, in, in, in Germany at the time. I came to know about cancers rather late, but I knew also that cancers ha has a very wonderful collection of the pamphlets. And so I've been plotting my way to come to cancers, actually. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but at some point when COVID is gone, we will talk about that. So why are the pamphlets important? And this is, I have to be very brief, but this is the most interesting part that I think I should share with you. Why are these pamphlets really, really important? What I'm going to say here will come st st straight from the, the, the first essay I published on the pamphlet here in tradition uh, in Teaching African Novel, which was published in 19, uh, sorry, in 2009 and edited by Gurav Desai. In that essay, reading the popular on a market romance and the, and, the, and, and, and the practice of everyday life, I took, I took my experience as a teacher of African literature and indeed of Africa at the University of Alberta into the reading of these pamphlets. And what I found out was that very little of the pamphlets, and indeed, 
popular culture at all. Uh, very little is taught in, in, in our classrooms. And the reason is not simply because the pamphlets are not available, at, at least they're available at the University of Alberta here. The real thing though is they're not, they not taught because the post-colonial establishment seem to have favored the written text in typical, typical European languages. So teaching this didn't, teaching popular culture such as on a market literature, for instance, didn't make any sense. Uh, and, and the other thing is that the scholars in the field, especially scholars like um, um, uh, Kwame Apia, for instance, and many more scholars have devalued the importance of popular expression, popular culture, popular literature. Uh, to the extent that uh, it became, for me, for instance, really, really an interesting thing to say, look, if this literature speaks to a particular group of people, why can't we study that group of people? Why shouldn't we do that? Um, so in 2010, I began introducing both these popular pamphlets in my literary classes uh, literature classes, as well as Nollywood films. The, the first important thing that I want to say about this pamphlet is simply that they teach us that there is another African epistemology that we need to understand. And that is the popular epistemology. Uh, what I referred to that in that essay as the other Africa, the Africa of the streets which is different from the Africa portrayed by say, Chinua Achebe in Things All Apart or, 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 or um, by Ikweyama, for instance. Uh, it, it, they're different, they're really, really different from that Africa, but that Africa is also important. That Africa of the street is important because if we understand that Africa, then we understand, we will get a, a more a holistic picture of what Africa is all about. In other words, bringing the Onitsha Market pamphlet into our, our classrooms offers us another set of epistem about Africa and what Africa holds for us in, in terms of literature and culture. Digitizing this then is very important because then we can disseminate this text to as many people as possible and to as many scholars as possible. The other thing that is important for me teaching the nature market pamphlet is simply to use them as a way of understanding the formation of the African city in colonial times. In other words, Onitsha becomes really, really central to that. We must understand that in the 19, in the early parts of the 20th century, Onisha was as important as Lagos, even though Lagos was declared the crown colony of the British Empire. Onisha was really, really important. And the pamphlet tells us a whole lot about that. The other, the third reason why these pamphlets are very, very important, it has to do with the way that gender roles are apportioned in the text. Because the pamphlets were written by men, I, 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 I've, I've searched, just, just, just um, coming, getting ready for this talk. I, I searched all over and I couldn't find any woman pamphlet here, or the old men. And therefore, what, what, we, what we find in this pamphlet is it's, it's simply, a masculine display of power so that the relationship, the gender relationship is qu quite clearly uneven. And why is this important? This is important because it allows us again to see how gender roles were apportioned at that particular time in the history of Nigeria. Um, Teaching this then 
gives us the opportunity to understand these roles and to make it clear uh, in our classes that literature, especially popular literature, has its fundamental role to play in the way, or had at that point in time, this fundamental role that it played in assigning gender roles to the sexes. Finally, um, and by no means the last though, um, digitizing these pamphlets will then allow us to return to that particular period in the history of Nigeria where education was beginning to form, uh, that's Western education, and how local people appropriated both the language as well as the technology. I, I should mention though uh, also the, that the, the appropriation of, of print technology was also very, very important here. Uh, the, the, this appropriation was really important and it came from, uh, from you know, the colonial past and the technology was uh, appropriated from people who brought um, expertise, um, printing expertise, uh, Europeans who brought printing expertise to Onicha at that time. And the surplus, the, the, the printing materials, the surplus that the British people brought to Nigeria, uh, they then appropriated and then made uh, capital of, of, of this technology and created local stories basically local stories about local people that concern everyday Africa in that sense. This then are some of the very, very important reasons why we should study this pamphlet. Now, of course, the, my last point here, of course, I have been told time and time again about the, the, the possibilities, that, sorry, the, the controversy around studying the uh, pamphlets outside of Africa. And my response has always been that if there is nobody in Africa or willing, that is willing to archive this material, then anybody who is willing to do that should do that. And so anybody who is interested in studying the pamphlets could go there anywhere in the world to do so. I remember uh, when I was doing my postdoctoral um, fellowship at the University of Bayreuth, one of the things I did was to, because they too have a sizable, uh, a sizable amount of furniture market pamphlet, not as good as yours, of course, but a sizable amount. What I proposed to them was, look, if you have, I said, I said to the librarian, if you have this amount of furniture market pamphlet, Pamphlets here, then we should complement these with the Nollywood films. And I started collecting the Nollywood films for the library. And today, um, they, uh, the university boasts of, well, some of the best uh, collection, early, at least early collection of what is now called old Nollywood films. And this is good because at least that there is, there is some way you can go um, to study this this, this expression, so this forms of popular expression from time to time. The controversy that, uh, that we should, we must make sure that we, we have a place somewhere in Africa to do this is for me okay insofar as there is the will to do that. But in a digital age such as we are in now, um, it could be anywhere. And this is one of the reasons why I'm really happy that um, can, the University of Kansas been able to do this. Uh, this is something I've been fighting very hard to do here at the University of uh, Alberta. Um, but it seems that the university is just, is just okay with having the pamphlets and asking me to wear gloves to go read the pamphlets from time to time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ono. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely work on you with that. And you're most welcome to come to Kansas and we'll see about promoting that collection that you have up there in Alberta. 
Okay, we're next going to hear from um, Ken Lorenz, who has come out of retirement to be with us today from KU Libraries. And Ken, I'll just let you introduce yourself. Thank you. We just need to unmute Ken, then we'll be good to go. Okay, there we are. I was saying I'm very pleased to be a part of the panel today. And um, I am the former librarian for African African American studies, along with other responsibilities. Um, I was a librarian at KU from 1984 un until, well, I retired the first time in 2006, and then I came back a couple of years after that once again. So um, I had the dubious distinction of having retired twice from the University of Kansas Libraries. Um, I thought what I would do today was, would be to reflect on the part that I played in this at the time at the time that I had this uh, assignment as African Studies librarian. And um, so there are several things that I want to say in connection with that. First of all, I should say that uh, I actually had very little to do with the acquisition of this collection. The um, site itself talks about the role that a former dean of libraries from the University, University of Kansas played, uh, whose his name was um, Thomas Buckman. And he visited Nigeria um, in 1966, which was, of course, a very fortuitous time because he came there at a time when the Onitsha market was uh, very active and uh, not too long before the uh, destruction which occurred as a result of the Biafran War. And he took an interest in, in these pamphlets while he was there and collected quite a sizable collection of them. So it was primarily his efforts that um, led to our holding of this collection at the University of Kansas. I did add a few individual um, titles that became available on the book market um, afterwards, but it is not primarily a collection that I collected myself. Um, of course, well, I guess the main thing that um, Liz and I did was to serve as advocates of the collection, making the argument that it was an important collection that needed to have greater um, visibility and use, and uh, we felt that um, this would be a good way to do that. As I reflect on that, it rather surprises me that we didn't have more resistance from that as we did. You know, I think that, um, you know, ordinarily you, you hear people saying, well, these, we got a limited number of resources. And if you spend them on this project, then it, there's less available for something else. You've all heard that argument. But we did um, do so successfully. So we got the, uh, the, the uh, collection up. Um, the other two parts of it that I specifically did that you see on the site are the next two things that I want to mention now, namely the bibliography and the uh, copyright um, uh, connection. On the bibliography, um, as I look at it now again, there's a couple of things that strike me. One is that it's out of date and needs some additional work to be done. Now, you might think that it, I made a mistake and, and I most likely did, but it depends upon the uh, particular items that you might have in mind. What I was doing actually is that I was updating another bibliography and therefore did not list some of the previously published items, such as, for example, Dodson's work, and uh, then also the article by Joseph Anafulu uh, in the uh, Research in African Literatures, published in volume four, 1973. That was really before the um, framework that I was working with in constructing my bibliography. The other thing that I did, um, for better or for worse perhaps, is that I de decided to throw in some general contextual works, which uh, I did because um, we could be serving such a broad audience as this goes online as it has. 
And so I, you don't know who your, all of your um, users or readers might be. And there might be some people who would appreciate having such works included. I am thinking here particularly of um, the work by Joseph Anafulu, the Igbo speaking peoples of Nigeria, and then also um, Nigerian Economy and Society by um, Gavin Williams. And these, these could probably be updated now with more recent sources of this, of this uh, scope. Um, so that may be one thing that might need to be considered. Um, so I, I think that some work could be done here in updating the bibliography from where it is now. The other thing that I want to talk about uh, briefly is um, copyright. Of course, when we bring up sites, um, sources like this, uh, we, we do need to be concerned about copyright laws. And I'll just uh, mention briefly here what the different steps were that I took to do this. Um, first of all, I, well, I made the, a list of all of the different publishers of these 21 digitized publications. And I searched then in all the sources that we had here at the University of Kansas um, to try and find out any contact information that I could find about them. I found none. So I then referred it to uh, a librarian at the uh, University of, uh, of Northwestern because they have a large collection at the Herskovitz Library and knew that they would most likely have some sources that we would not have. So uh, I asked them to, to do the same as I had done to search through whatever contact information they might have for us to contact the publishers requesting their permission to, do, to digitize these titles. And um, then finally, after doing all of that, I went to our university um, um, person who was in charge of checking on the, the legality of this, university council, that's what I meant, and um, explained what I had done and um, she said in her judgment that that was sufficient for us to have the permission to bring up the digitized um, form of these uh, publications. And um, I think with that, that's really all I have to contribute. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Liz. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. Elspeth Healy is next. From KU Libraries. Hi, yes. <laughs> so I'll continue on the story from uh, Ken. My name is Elspeth Healy, and I'm a special collections librarian at the Kenneth Spencer Research Library. And uh, bear with me for a moment while I attempt to share my screen here. <laughs> um, Okay, is, is everyone able to see this? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I join you as the least expert person on the panel. Um, as I said, I'm a special collections librarian and not a subject expert in African studies or in the more technical side of digital collections. Um, but I'm certainly an enthusiastic proponent of the collection having witnessed over the years its potency as a resource for students in the classroom and for scholars. And so I want to start today's presentation by recognizing that much of what I'm about to share um, emerges from and reports on the actions of my wonderful colleagues at KU Libraries past and present and the actions that they have undertaken. Um, so. Uh, oh, apologies, I'm just having a little technical glitch here. So following um, from Ken's discussion of the development history and significance of KU's Onitsha Market Literature Digital Collection, my presentation will address its movement forward in time, including the 2016 migration of the digital collection to Omeka, um, the impact of the digital collection on the continuing growth of Spencer Research Library's physical Onitsha Market Literature Collection and um, potential future directions for the project to expand. Um, and again, as noted in my introduction, <laughs> the discussion today really recounts the work that my fellow colleagues in KU libraries have done and continue to do in support of this project. 
uh, the initial launch of the Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche market literature collection um, in 2003 was a static HTML site. And here through the magic of the Wayback Machine, <laughs> um, I'm able to share images of what that site looked like when it was first captured by the Internet Archive um, in 2006. As Ken outlined, um, the site offered historical and cultural context for the emergence of and nature of Nietzsche market literature, provided related resources, including a bibliography of writings and scholarship on Nietzsche market literature, and presented um, the digital collection itself, uh, which comprised um, of a list of 21 digitized pamphlets, um, linking both to more detailed um, descriptive information and uh, to the PDF files of the actual pamphlets, um, as well as, and so there you can see some of the descriptive information, uh, as well as a bibliography of the then at the time 101 volumes um, that comprised Spencer Research Library's Onicha Market Literature Collection. Um, uh, by 2016, though, <laughs> um, 13 years after its launch and a virtual millennia in digital time, um, the site was beginning to show its age and presented challenges in terms of maintenance. The decision was made to migrate the site to Omeka, um, which by then was the primary platform for KU's uh, digital exhibitions. And I suspect that many here are familiar with Omeka, but for those who are not, it is in the language of their promotional synopsis, an open source web publishing platform for sharing digital collections and creating media rich exhibitions. Uh, Scott Hanrath, who in 2016 was KU's assistant dean um, for IT and discovery services, summarized the decision as follows. Omeka was in use and supported for similar projects, and we had multiple people familiar with using it, so it was a natural destination. Sustainability and standardization were a part of that, um, and also offered the possibility of more easily adding additional volumes in the future. Scott Hanrath assembled a team that would orchestrate the project, which included Musa Alaka, KU's uh, Librarian for African Global and International Studies as the content expert, specialist, um, Eric Radio for metadata curation, Mary Rappel for web updates and content, Marion Reed, who served as a project manager, and uh, Beth Whitaker of Distinctive Collections was the co-sponsor for the project. Um, as part of the migration, <clears throat> the unencoded bibliographic metadata from the static site, which had originally been pulled from the pamphlets Mark records, that is machine readable catalog records, was now cross swapped to Dublin Core, a metadata element set uh, and schema. Um, the more detailed narrative descriptions of the pamphlets that had provided so much of the contextual richness of the original site were inco incorporated into the Dublin Core description field. And um, though the original static website had a standalone copyright and permissions page in Omeka, the rights information um, was included at the item level for each object using the Dublin Core rights field um, that was standardized in order to be as clear as possible and through the inclusion of a machine readable URI um, linking to the appropriate rights statement category on rightsstatement.org. The migration team <laughs> worked remark with remarkable efficiency and the project um, was mostly completed in the spring of 2016 with the old static site retired by the end of the year. As KU began increasingly to use Islandora as the platform and repository for its digital collections, um, there were further investigations as to whether we might migrate the legacy TIFF files on which the PDFs were based to that platform. But as is often the case with digital humanities projects over a decade old, the TIFF files fell below current digitization standards, too small, too low resolution. And so, as I will return to you shortly, <laughs> the decision was made not to deposit them in Islandora, but to rescan when it came time for a future expansion of the collection. <clears throat> and so you can see here um, the current state uh, collection. Uh, as Ken Lorenz outlined, the initial Unicha Market Literature collection arrived in 1966, acquired by then KU Director of Libraries, Thomas R. Buckman. Um, and 
though the precise <laughs> um, numbers of the collections are a little bit misty with the passage of time, it appears that the collection stood at approximately 94 items when it was acquired. Um, and then in the intervening 37 or so years, expanded by about seven to yield the 101 pamphlets cited in the collection bibliography on the original Onicha market literature site. We all know that digitization makes collections um, more visible for researchers, but it also increases their visibility for donors and booksellers. So to my mind, it's no coincidence that following the creation of the digital collection, the physical Onicha collection um, grew from 101 to 163 pamphlets, that is to over one and a half times its size prior to the launch of the digital collection, so that it now stands at just over one tenth of the 1,583 entries outlined in Peter Hogg and Ilse Sternberg's um, British Library publication, Market Literature from Nigeria, a checklist. So a quick synopsis of the collection's recent growth offers an indication of how digitization can spur collection development. Um, and here, uh, I won't go into these details, um, but we'll only point out that offers from dealers and donors alike came very much um, through the visibility that the collection brought. Um, as sort of have the more recent um, revisitings and by my colleague, former colleague, Karen Cook, um, who oversaw the curation of that particular collection area um, and that now um, with Karen's retirement, I have taken over. Um, as has been shown time and again and by digital projects, digital collections rarely lead to the obsolescence of the physical collections from which they originate. Rather, they have the potential to ignite not only the interest of researchers in the collection, but also draw the attention of donors, book dealers, and the librarians who steward the collections to and leading to um, added investment. So <laughs> what of the future? Having touched briefly on how both the digital and physical Anitsha collections have evolved, um, I want to turn to future directions. From a technological standpoint, um, a key goal will be to increase the usability of the collection, not only by expanding its scope, but also increasing its interoperability. In practical terms, this means uh, rescanning at high resolution the original 21 pamphlets alongside a further selection from Spencer's Anitsha Market Literature Collection for ingestion into KU's current digital um, repository and delivery platform, Islandora. Uh, there, researchers will have access to images as downloadable high-resolution TIFFs and associated derivative formats like JPEGs and PDFs. Also part of the suite of exportable files um, would be uh, Dublin Core metadata and OCR capture uh, plain text files. And Islandora as a platform offers the capacity for participation in community of standards associated with the International Image Interoperability Framework, IIIF, um, which is a set of open standards that helps archives, libraries, and museums make the most of their digitized collections um, with deep zoom, annotation capabilities, and more. So the Amake Omeka site could live on, but with a little technological integration, draw on and point to resources in Islandora. This would pair the more narrative exhibition style presentation of the current Omeka site um, with the more robust suite of exportable and, and interoperable um, file options that a platform like Islandora permits. And with this more comprehensive suite of digital outputs, um, the digital collection would be better positioned as a starting point for future digital humanities projects, whether in the classroom or within the larger context of scholarship, um, enabling researchers to develop, for example, their own annotation overlays or prepare its OCR text for data mining and computational analytics. Now, how to expand. <laughs> um, in an ideal world, we develop a workflow to digitize all 100 63 of Spencer Research Library's market literature pamphlets, but as these things sometimes take time, I'd actually like to open the question to the researchers present about how they would prioritize um, particular pamphlets for digitization moving ahead. 
in my own conversations with Dr. Yeku um, in terms of what he would like to see prioritized in an expansion of Spencer's digital collection. He cited an interest in increasing the representation of political oriented pamphlets. Um, and so uh, one path for future digitization might be to target pamphlets that fall into particular subgenres or subject areas. Um, so for example, uh, prioritizing works that address politics could lead us to digitizing titles such as Umo's Be uh, Before Darkness Falls, which addresses the progress of socialist and communist influence in Nigeria or um, a number of titles uh, reflecting on the life and assassination of John F. Kennedy from a Nigerian and African perspective, um, as well as plays addressing the lives of Jomo Kenyatta and Kwame Nkrumah um, and other figures associated with Pan-African movements of liberation from colonial rule. Um, in looking <laughs> uh, at expansion through the lens of authorship, questions arise as to whether to prioritize some of the most prolific um, market literature writers, um, or uh, to aim for a variety of, or to aim for the sort of the widest possible variety of authors, um, including those who may have only written one title. However, <laughs> Don Dodson has also argued for publishers rather than authors as the pivotal figures um, in Onitsha market literature, uh, noting that the literature's cultural aspect however significant is inseparable from the entrepreneurial, or as he explains, commercial constraints mold cultural conventions. With publishers often editing and reworking texts as they saw fit to increase sellability, um, and then perhaps an important direction would be to target a representation of the major publishers of Onitsha market literature, um, some of whom I have listed here. And I'm happy to report that all of these are currently represented by at least one pamphlet in KU's 21 pamphlet digital collection, save for Apollos Brothers, um, with Joku and Sons best represented with, 20, with seven of the 21 pamphlets. Um, then finally, by one accounting, if a title has already been uh, represented either in KU's digital collections or in those of the University of Florida or in the 78 Onitsha pamphlets microfilmed by the Cooperative Africana um, Materials Project, PAMP, then it would make sense to deprioritize them in favor of others not already digitized. Um, but at the same time, tracing the alterations made by certain publishers and their reprinting and repackaging of particular titles might offer another form of insight into the shifting markets, tastes, and concerns of the Onitsha milieu. Um, this comparative reading across editions is something that literary scholars are accustomed to undertaking, and the digitization of the same works across multiple editions and iterations would open up the genre to a different type of scholarship. So I've put before you these questions and considerations with an eye to expanding Spencer's uh, digital Onitsha collection, um, but they're equally considerations that might influence and guide my own work in terms of collection development. Um, I suspect that the answer as to what to prioritize <laughs> um, from the above might be from you a little bit of each. Um, and I think one of the strengths of the initial 21 pamphlet digital collection is how effectively it simultaneously addresses the imperatives of both representation and representativeness in its selection. So in closing, I'm especially eager to hear in our conversation from researchers um, who are present in today's digital room about where their priorities would lie for future expansions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Elspeth. You've given us some good food for thought here, um, and we'll we'll take some of these um, these questions up in the in the in the Q and A. Uh, our final speaker today is Daniel Ribusen from the University of Florida, and he will wrap things up for us. And then, if anyone who has questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A or in the chat, and we'll tackle them when we're finished here. Thanks, Daniel. Hi, nice to be here. I really appreciate the invitation and a chance to come back virtually to the town of my birth. One of my very first memories is of the Jayhawk at a football game. <laughs> um, can I share my screen?
So I'm happy just to take the moment to say all, the, all of what was said already. I'm the African Studies Curator at the University of Florida Libraries, and I work in the Special and Area Studies Collections Department. Uh, and I believe we began digitizing the small collection we put up was really only intended as a, a taste of what was there, I think in 2011. And I remember my initial interest started in about 2004, a time when I have a, a, a word file, I think, from Ken, who provided that to me at the time. So that was a much more extensive list than the materials we had available at UF. Clearly we'll have to have a follow-up panel all in person so that we can get Dr. Ono to Kansas and you can come back to Lawrence, Daniel. <laughs> I would love that. Are you able to share your screen or do you still need? Author? I don't see, let's see, where do I need to do that? Is it up in the view on the top right there? Um, you should have an option at the bottom in the middle, share screen, it might be green along the bar at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. All right, is that working? Yes, yes. Okay, apologies for the image here, which is not related to Anitra in any way, but I'll maybe I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. So my interest is uh, really in these works as vernacular literature, and that is not necessarily a matter of the language of a text, but in that it represents an author's membership in a community of readers. So does the work speak to and offer an inside perspective on the community's lived experience and the local context of events at a particular time and place? Vernacular or street literature relates closely to oral culture. And that's, of course, among the oldest human art forms. Uh, it supports social cohesion through adversity and may also serve as an outlet for political or popular protest. So like musical forms, uh, it can thrive in modern urban and a state context. And actually, you know, early written accounts very closely uh, derive from oral uh, materials. This is an example of the uh, Kebra Nagast of Ethiopia. Um, you know, it's just one of many beautiful examples from African centralized states during the Middle Ages. It, you know, it not hugely widespread, but, but certainly an important part of uh, African history and culture. And I love this one in particular that it incorporates figures that help to illustrate the texts and make them accessible to uh, their audience. The Mali Empire's King origin story, the Sunjata oral epic, was told by generations of Monday griots and was transmitted to Europeans through Ibn Khaldun uh, and other travelers who visited the empire in the 1300s. European maps like this one at the time focused on cosmology for didactic purposes rather than geography. So it links them to oral traditions. This is an example of European pamphlet literature, which thrived for centuries there. Uh, this is a cheap or chapbook example from the early 19th century that's very similar to other street literature dating back to the 16th century. Um, and I want to mention, you know, some of the early uh, African literature published by European publishers. They're landmarks in African literature. They also reflect oral themes, importantly. 
but the fact is that they were filtered by editors and publishers who were interested in representing African culture to Western audiences. So that distinguishes them from truly vernacular literature. Obishina argues that the Onitsha pamphlet authors relied on folk tales and says their constant combination of entertainment with didactic intent, especially the explicitly stated moral, derives directly from African folk tales. So these are just a couple of examples. The Anicha book market catered to newly literate Igbo readership and publishers who had recently gotten access to used presses hired writers from the community to supply an avid local readership with popular themes and moralistic stories. These exclusively male writers, as was just mentioned, uh, the author Newell argues, often used women as metaphors for an ailing body politic and with ambivalence toward modernity expressed in gender, gendered terms. So that's one of the, as has already been mentioned, one of the really interesting things about the pamphlets is they're, they're kind of, uh, problematic representations of gender. Kurt Thomas worked in William or Bill French's University Place Bookshop near Union Square in New York City's Greenwich Village. Uh, and there he purchased uh, the owner's pamphlet collection at a time when he wrote, quote, our shared interest knew no other market. In other words, they couldn't sell them but he was still interested in the materials. And uh, New York University purchased the rest of, of uh, Bill French's stock in 1995 when it closed. Um, but I think this just brings up the, the, um, the role of booksellers, not just in Nigeria, but in the US. Um, here's a couple of really interesting pieces about Anicha market literature and the interest of those who owned bookshops and, and sold the materials. And, and uh, Simon Ottenberg and Bill French may be the main actors that we have to thank in North America, at least, for many of the pamphlets that are available in library collections today. So as I think I, I mentioned, um, I think uh, 2000 and uh, 11 was when we began digitizing a, just a small handful of the Anicha market literatures at UF. The table on the left shows a cumulative view of the most popular titles in the collection. And on the right here is a bar chart kind of showing the growth over time, where up until say 2017, there were not 4,000 views of any of the items in a month, but that, that became close to that now. And, and overall, the collection has seen about a quarter of a million views over that period of time. As I said, I, I ran across the pamphlets in about 2004, got very interested myself, much as I, I know Ken was, and uh, it, it took a little work, but I, I moved my, the, the materials at my library from the circulating collections into special collections at that time because I realized that they were valuable, scarce, and kind of demanded more, more access. So, but it wasn't until 2011 that they, they became digitized. And if you'll permit me, I wanna make a bit of a shameless plug for a different vernacular literature collection, which I am working on now. This is the work of Papa Mfumueto, Le Premier, as he brands himself. It's a very different approach than the pamphlets, but this 2017 accession kind of uh, gives a different perspective on vernacular publishing and street comic book original art. This, I believe, is the global first representation of original comic street art from Africa in any publicly accessible collection worldwide. And these are obviously a representation of Mami Wata, the extremely widely known oral tradition of a seductive but dangerous water spirit. 
And this is speaking directly to the creator's neighborhood and his community in Kinshasa using Lingala, which is super unusual in any African comic books. They're almost all intended to, to be widely uh, read, but in fact, Papa Mfumueto specifically wanted to speak to his neighborhood. And this is an example here, kind of two, one image derived from another, where in his comic style, he's presenting a C Cinderella story on, on the left, one of his most popular series, Mama Mbanda, Mwana Yambanda, sorry. And um, you can see Blondine, the character on the left, is left doing the dishes while her stepsister is, is living the life of luxury. But in this second image, which I think is particularly interesting, the creator backs up and shows his audience, and in fact himself, in that same image. So thereby kind of giving you a real sense of the vernacular aspect to the collection. And I'm going to be happy to share all the sources and, and connections with these materials with anyone who's, who's interested. Feel free to contact me and I'll, I'll make these publicly accessible. Um, so it's really exciting to, um, to participate in the, in the discussion, but I want to signal that there's other vernacular literatures out there um, and not widely available. And I'd very much like to hear people's interest in, in some of the, the other forms that are available as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you to everybody. This has been very fruitful. And I think we have um, learned a lot and we have already a few questions in the chat and we will take um, any and all questions in the chat or in the, the Q&A. So don't be shy, please feel free to put your questions in. But let's get started. Um, we had a question from Tony about um, the text being labeled as, as pamphlets, um, the use of that, that term pamphlet, and should we continue to reproduce that, that label of pamphlet? Okay, the floor is open to anyone who would like to take that question. Well, um, I'm sure that Tony directed this to me, actually. So, so. Tony was my classmate, uh, schoolmate at the University of Ibadan. So maybe that's why he may have directed this to me. And he wasn't, he had problems with connection because it's, he, he, he is in Lagos at this moment. Um, so he's sending his message from Lagos, uh, which has some problems with connections. Um, well, yes, this is controversial. There's no doubt about it. But, but I think that the reason this was done was simply to make the distinction between um, the full length novel and the pamphlet as an occasional sp spontaneous reaction to everyday life and, and to, uh, to what happened that was happening in the, in the locality at the time. Um, and some of some of the pamphlets actually do not do not come to the level of a novel of the novel. And don't forget, um, they are not many of the pamphlets are not genre bound, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, so a pamphlet may start with a story and end with a play, or may start with a poem and end with something else. So, in, in that sense, I, I may not want to quarrel with the taxonomy at all, because it is, it is a pamphlet. And if we, if we take another look at it uh, from the perspective of the, of the uh, producers and the, and the uh, marketers themselves, they saw this as pamphlets. They, they, they saw this as commercial objects, which was why they were not interested in archiving anything. And this was all, this is still all, this is still the problem with Nollywood. So when I asked them, I said, I said to them, I said to some of the, in my interviews, so how come after two years, I can't find a copy of your film? And one of them told me this, um, this is, um, um, 
one of the religious preachers, um, Helen Okpabio, said, well, it doesn't matter if it serves its purpose. So what else? You don't need to keep it. You know, I don't even have the original. I, you know, for me, a university person, this is really <laughs> strange that you can't keep your original copy. And for them on the market pamphleteers, the pamphlets were disposable. They, they, they were not produced to last. So I wasn't quite, um, I, although I was shocked, I was asked to wear gloves to read the pamphlets in my university here. But, but the, the, the paper on which the stories are printed, very, they're very, very um, brittle. They're very brittle. They, they, they fall apart easily uh, because the idea was not to archive anything. And, and so in, in that sense, um, I, I think that, I mean, it's debatable, but I still think that the, the taxonomy itself can still hold um, as pamphlets. I, I don't see them as novels in, this, in the sense of Tolstoy, for instance, or War and Peace, or, or this, this very uh, huge novel, uh, novels that we read from the West or thereabout. And, and these are spontaneous stories told for the now, not for tomorrow, for the now, so that once they serve their purposes, then you know they disappear, just as Nollywood uh, filmmakers are now doing, and which is which is a, which is a sad thing, which is a crying shame. But but that's what it is. It's what it is. Um, I, I won't quarrel with that for too long, except I find something else to replace that. For now, I'll use that. All right, thank you. We have a, a similar question, I would say, about terminology, um, and that was about the use of, of vernacular. Um, Deanna, you, you mentioned vernacular publishing in, in comic street art. And, and Dr. Solomon is asking, um, is it proper to call someone else's language vernacular? Right? Can an Igbo speaker refer to English, for instance, as vernacular? So I don't know if any of the librarians want to speak to that term or anyone else on the panel. I think so. I'm not a linguist myself. I think that's perfectly appropriate to call English, you know, vernacular in the city of Gainesville, for example, where I am. Um, but as I said, I guess maybe too quickly, the I'm thinking in terms of vernacular literature, not as in terms of language, but in terms of the author's connection to a community and his speaking, his or her speaking to that community um, specifically. So. Um, it's a little different usage, and um, so in that sense, I don't feel I have to defend it in terms of using it as a as a description of a language. I think that I think that it's it's very common in postcolonial studies to question these kinds of usage. Uh, uh, it is because then it's often inscribed with all kinds of political activism, right? So it's vernacular itself, uh, the, the word itself, it's very uh, loaded with colonial intentions, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's the, it's, it's like, I mean, if you come from West Africa, for instance, if you describe somebody as a, you say, you, in pidgin, you say, that man a bushman, you know, which means it's a bushman, you know, or something. The word bush here is, for the for the for the West Africans to be taken to mean uncivilized, somebody who is a savage, because the word has been inscribed in colonial times with a lot of cultural uh, depravity, cultural uh, stupidity, and so it becomes a political thing. It's not 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 um, not the cultural uh, interpretation that will be given to it in that sense. So in the, in that sense, yes, you cannot. In fact. Achebe also talked about this. Uh, Chino Achebe talked about this in, in um, the essay on Conrad's Heart of Darkness, when he suddenly veered off and then said, ah, oh, yeah, so uh, somebody, somebody from England was talking about some African language and then makes, makes this reference to the language as vernacular. But he won't make that same claim to the English language. Yes, that's true, but but this is only from you know the very political perspective, and and so we 
all I need to say here is that we need to be conscious of all of this. When we talk, when we do this, we maybe a footnote would be really, really great in this sense. Just give a footnote to say, look, I'm using this in this sense or, or thereabout. Yeah. I think this speaks to a broader issue, right? We've there's been conversations about decolonization, right? Decolonizing museums. Um, I'm wondering, are the librarians having those kinds of conversations about decolonizing the library? And, and if so, what do those look like? I, I would say absolutely. I can let Elspeth speak on that as well. I don't, I don't, I don't well, I'm not too sure. I mean, if you put, the energy market as, as, as it is in my university, if you put the energy market literature uh, text in a special collections library, then that is not decolonization. Uh, that is apartheid actually. Why separate it from the main library? Why not put it there? Of course, you can give all the, all the, all the reasons that you can to saying that, look, this these texts are too Britain, they will, they will be destroyed if you kept them there and so on and so forth. But uh, I, don't, I don't see any conscious attempt to do that here, at least. To, to the, the very fact that you put them in a special place and you have to ask permission to go and read them, that's another thing. Um, and may, may, some people might just argue that this is because you want to essentialize, yeah, essentialize the text, you want to, you want to create some kind of uh, demarcation between what is what is the norm, so to speak. I mean, I think certainly there's been a lively discussion within library circles about uh, also the <laughs> um, uh, the representation within the profession. Um, and and sort of having subject expertise available. Unfortunately, KU is currently without an African studies um, librarian, so uh, something that they hope to rehire um, in the future soon. Um, and so certainly there's the question of who who is it that is stewarding these collections and are those individuals, individuals who have expertise in the area? I, I think I said up front um, that having inherited this curatorial area from my colleague and then sort of I oversee all of the materials um, currently within special collections since her retirement, I do not. I will be the first to say I do not have particular subject expertise in this area. And so part of my sense of responsibility then is to find a way to make the material accessible to researchers um, wherever they are in the world who may want to gain access to it. And I think that was um, one of the motivating factors for the initial, uh, initial um, digital project that uh, Professor McGonigal and Ken Lorenz undertook <laughs> now, uh, you know, almost two decades ago, um, the recognition of this as research worthy, rich material um, that needed to be made available to a broader audience, including um, an audience that might be able to access, um, access it in its country of origin um, through the online environment. So I think I think that's a, a vital question to keep at the forefront in these projects moving ahead, um, and really um, drawing on the expertise <laughs> of uh, subject experts will be important, um, particularly scholars in the field of um, Nigerian literature um, and post-colonial studies. One well, agree. Sorry. Oh. Go ahead, David, Daniel. One brief okay. point that I wanted to make was that um, when you think about this um, context of uh, having almost a system of apartheid where the collections are separated by putting them into special collections, that's part of the reason for doing something such as a digitization project, mm -hmm. because it overcomes that separation and makes them much more widely available. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. I, I completely agree with you. The, the other thing we should plan to do, or, well, I mean, I can't, I can't, of course, I can't dictate for um, Kansas, but the other thing is, you know, uh, we, we, there is the need for us to, to 
make it open for Nigerian universities and African universities to have access uh, to these materials so that they can actually study themselves in this material rather than come to Kansas since resources are very lean in many of these African universities. So people who want to write dissertations on this can do that. I, I couldn't do it because I, you know, I just, I just didn't find that uh, that that uh, resource at that time, but, but there, there are people who write to me all the time. You know, would like to study this, would like to do this, and you know, once it's online, then it becomes easy for them to do this from anywhere in the world um, that they find themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to go ahead and again put out my plea, since we do have an audience that includes scholars in this area, um, I really would love to hear uh, your priorities in terms of selection criteria for further digitization within the collection. What are the types of pamphlets and the criteria for future digitization that most engages you? What would you like to see more of um, in such digital collections? Um, for me, the whole business, in fact, I was going to speak to that, the whole business of making this a priority itself, it's not, for me, an urgent thing or something that we need to do right now, um, especially so because the pamphlets don't allow you to do that. Uh, and here is the reason. So you can make broad categories, as Obiechina did in his book, um, Politics street philosophy, romance. You can make that broad category, but you know that each of these pamphlets slips into the other thing. There's always something else. There's all, so, so you can make a very specific categorization of how you want to do this. But what you're doing already is great. Just get as many pamphlets as you can and archive them and make them available. So those who will study them will make their own priorities in terms of, you know, how they want to study the pamphlets and what they want to do with the pamphlets. Uh, I find, I find Obiechina's uh, um, general categorization very, very important. The other thing I'd like to talk about, and, and again, this is to, to, to Kansas, actually, is, is if it is possible, is to provide the most up-to-date, most up-to-date, um, critical take on all of these pamphlets in a book form as a book of essay, uh, essays, right? So that they will accompany, they will be part of the project of, 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 the, of the archive itself, of the digital archive itself, because this is really, really important. It's important because the only major book on the on the market pamphlet, apart from, apart from um, uh, uh, what's this guy's name? The one that was just mentioned. Uh, the real, the full study, the only full study of them is still is still Obiechina's book. And this this book was published in 1971. So you have scattered essays here and there, but it's it, it just not it's just not a thing. Again, the reason is simply because of this idea that postcolonial studies must be about text, post-colonial post literary studies, must be about texts written by people who've gone to England to study or, the, or America to study. This is, this is, I find this really, really curious, which is why we need to do something and really quickly too, so that those who want to come back to this pamphlet, because it's very, very important. The pamphlets, the pamphlets, they teach us that there is another African epistem, about how people live in the streets and about the streets. And we need to do this, I think. We need to produce this, I think. And there'll be no better place. No better place than Kansas and the U of A. I don't, please, am I allowed to speak? I know I should be at the background, but I just want to play the devil's advocate for one minute and push back against what Professor Okome just said. I mean, I, I'm all on board for this, but when we think about an alternative epistem for understanding Africa from a street context, is it not possible somebody could also accuse us of essentializing a particular pastness 
that doesn't exist anymore today. We want to understand Africa from the streets, but not through a presentist argument that you know returns us to an era that doesn't become legible anymore today. What, what would you say? Okay, I'll, I'll just quote for you, Elliot. Tradition is not just now, tradition is from the past into the present that, that guides you into the future. So if you want to understand Africa in a very holistic manner, you, you still have to go to these people. Um, and, and let me just give you a very practical example. What is happening in Nollywood is not different today. It's not different from what is what happened with the Onitra Market pamphlet, yes. It's not different. If you talk about the, the domestication of technology, the, the, the everyday thing, the spontaneity of the everyday thing that you find in Hollywood, this was what the Anitra Market people did. In fact, the infrastructure of the publication of the Anitra Market literature, you can compare that to the infrastructure of Hollywood today. And most of the so-called marketers, the traders who, who began this process, this knowledge process itself, they, they, they are affiliated one way or the other to Onitra, the time that, that produced this pamphlet. So you cannot really study uh, Nollywood in isolation of that particular period. In other words, culture, as Shoin will put it, culture is now and ever changing. So the culture of the past must speak to the culture of now and then form the culture of tomorrow. We, we need to do that. We do not need to understand Africa from things fall apart alone, or from Shoinka, or from, from um, uh, um, Aikwe Ama. No, it would be wrong. Because the, 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 this, these authors have a different take to the idea of Africa. They have a very different take to the idea of Africa itself. I, I, I mean, I just said that just to bring the very obvious perspective that social media today, which is an area, a space I study a lot, yeah. does the same kind of thing the pamphlets were doing in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Nollywood also. So that's aesthetic continuum is something we can obviously mm -hmm. track. And hopefully the kind of meta critical publication you, you, you're suggesting is something we might be able to pick up along the line here at KU. Liz, I, I, I'll go back. Give it back to yeah, you. Thank you, James. Um, it sounds like it would be fruitful to have some sort of workshop or conference, perhaps, right, to bring people together to think about creating something like this, or perhaps something, um, something alternative, like an alternative publication that might be again on the internet, because the whole idea was to bring this market that was destroyed, sort of bring aspects of that to the internet with this project, which was just a sampling, right? The, the pamphlets that were digitized were just a sampling and that was just a start, but it's just taken us a while to continue on. Okay. Um, excellent idea. We have one question in the Q&A um, coming all the way from Uppsala um, about um, capturing African literatures. So I'll turn that over to the specialists on the panel here to address. I think you can all see this from Ashley Harris in the Q&A. What's, okay, what's the, okay, I have to go there. What's the question, yeah. If you click on the Q&A, yeah, yeah, yeah. see, yeah. Are there, so, are there yeah. difference of well, unique challenges compared to other ephemeral collections? What are the political implications of middle? Uh, it's a huge one, eh? I think it's for the librarians. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 to tell you the truth, I don't know I can if I can speak to this in the way that you want me to. But one thing is clear though, uh, the, yeah, there are unique challenges to, to collecting this, these uh, pamphlets uh, as everywhere in the, in, in, on, uh, on the continent. And, and that challenge is that the people who produce them do not consider any archival value to them. Therefore, they, they just don't, they, just, they don't keep records about these things. And that may be a huge challenge. But as we, as we already know, uh, there are people who are interested in these things and they, from time to time, uh, they do uh, collect these uh, artifacts and bring it elsewhere where they can be properly stored. 
I, I forgot to mention, um, which is which is the problem of being the first speaker. You don't, you're so afraid of it of, of time. You don't say everything that you want to say because you want to keep within the time frame. But I forgot to say that uh, the collection here we have about up to seventy five pamphlets here, and they were collected by a guy named Andre Andre Niketi in the 19, late 1950s and 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, I'm just um, um, putting this out for Ken, who gave us a very wonderful, wonderful overview of what, uh, of, of, of how the collections came to Kansas. Yeah. So I, I, I have, I have, I have, I have this before me here. This is the Andrew Nikketi that I got from the, the library. Um, the, the, it's 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 really really broad based um, everything <clears throat> you can find yeah. Uh, in in response to uh, Ashley Harris's question about metadata um, for such ephemeral materials, I think uh, the uh, Hogg and uh, Sternberg um, checklist <laughs> shows some of the challenges involved um, for these publications which often intentionally don't include a date of publication so that they're always seemingly <laughs> um, relevant. And so um, it does require a more robust set of um, details in catalog records in the metadata to be able to distinguish between different publications. And I think anyone who's ever tried to work through this in terms of the records and WorldCat will realize that this is a problem that has not yet been solved, but the kinds of details and the details that are included in the Hogg and Sternberg um, checklist that allow you to make those differentiations are, of course, things that you would traditionally include in a catalog record, like the page number. Um, uh, but in addition to the publisher, um, uh, the publisher may remain the same at various points in time, but the printer may change. Um, the publisher may remain the same, but the price on the volume may change. Yes, um, yeah. Notations about the color and nature of the uh, paper wrappers of the pamphlets um, can provide further information. Similarly, um, sometimes occasionally they will include edition statements, fourth edition enlarged. Um, so being sure to document and record um, those features. The larger question of, um, say, the application of Library of Congress subject headings um, does get into sort of that political issue of who is it that is ascribing <laughs> um, these subject headings um, to the volumes. And of course, um, uh, the long running problems um, with the nature of Library of Congress subject headings, um, their uh, staticness and inability to, um, or <laughs> uh, sort of slowness, um, and I think this is increasingly changing, um, but uh, slowness to discard um, language that is now obsolete um, and, and sort of, um, you know, offensive, <laughs> to be honest, um, on, uh, in relation to um, how subject headings are applied. And again, I am uh, not a cataloger, so there will be people who are much better positioned um, to discuss these things. But yes, for ephemeral literature um, that often uh, just, you know, as with many pamphlets and chapbooks, um, in other situations, uh, seeks not necessarily to obscure <laughs> um, uh, the precise moment of its creation, but allows for a certain vagueness there, um, having more detailed information about page count, uh, publisher and printer, price listing variants throughout um, is really important for distinguishing between copies. Um, and then of course, um, being able to cite uh, reference numbers like this is, um, you know, Hogg and Sternberg at 907, <laughs> um, if you're able to use a checklist like that as a reference source. Yeah, I, I should just say briefly that, you know, the reason why all the chair market, um, the writers, you know, uh, uh, who were writing at the time, the reason they didn't put it, they didn't put dates in their pamphlets simply because they want the pamphlets to be, not to be dated. So, so they said, no, no, we're not putting any dates here. So anytime you buy it, it's like it was printed right now. You know, so they didn't want to do that. So it's it it was part of a strategy, so to speak. Just just as it was part of a strategy to put the face of 
of, of, of a Caucasian woman in the cover of a pamphlet, when the story actually is about a black girl, you know, a local black girl, it's simply to draw attention to the pamphlet itself, yeah. All right, we're getting close to the end of our time. We're gonna take one final uh, question. It's from Tony in the q and um, Actually, two different questions here about um, what the readership might expect in terms of some sort of immediate conversations about these texts. And then asking Elspeth to think about how that might facilitate continue such conversations. Do you think though that those who produce them and their relationships Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> um, just, just take, if you take a look, a, just a cursory look at, at, at the, the, the titles, it's, you'll be amazed that they're very topical. They're very immediate, it, you know, like they talk about Lumumba and then suddenly Lumumba becomes not just a, a fashion statement, it's also a political statement, you know? Uh, they talk about things that, are hap that, that, that were happening at the same time. So there is the spontaneity of the text, which actually um, some people have, some scholars have argued was the reason why some of the pamphlets didn't last longer. I mean, they, they just, they fade out as, as soon as the, the topic of the day changes to something else, you know. Uh, so, so it's, it's yes, they're supposed to create uh, the basis for discussion, further discussion around, around the subject. Let me give you one very important uh, uh, example. When the pamphlets, if you look at the pamphlets about Hitler, you'll be surprised. At a time when Hitler was vilified all over the world, they, some of the pamphleteers, they think about Hitler as a great man, because he was able to defeat the British Empire. So, 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 so here you're finding a new kind of response to international affairs. Yeah. And those responses were, were immediate to what was happening at that, at that time. So yes, the, 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 the pamphlets are supposed to generate discussion around the subject that they, they dealt with at that time, whether it's Lumumba, whether it is Kwame Nkuruma, whether it is uh, um, 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 JFK. I, I like the JFK ones more because they, they tie in very, very well to JFK and slavery and emancipation, even though they get everything wrong, but that's not, that's not important. What is important is that you know, they, they want to show a certain sense of modernity. They want to be inserted in this colonial modernity, so to speak, uh, even, even when we know that uh, the language is awful sometimes and, and, and even the, 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 the facts are wrong. Shakespeare is quoted as Goethe, Goethe is quoted as Shakespeare. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is the very fact that you're dealing with this subject at, at, that, at the point where uh, the subject was important to what was happening in the locality. And in terms of continuing uh, conversations with the communities from which these uh, uh, niche market literature um, originates, I mean, I think the most important thing, and, and again, this is something more that could be thought of as the project goes forward, um, is really building in mechanisms to the site to allow feedback from researchers and users everywhere and to maintain um, sort of conversations uh, with the scholarly groups um, and, and sort of everyday researchers as well um, who are engaging with this literature. So to get a better sense of who's using the material, how and how we can serve their needs. I think that is often the goal of a digital collection like this to meet the needs of um, the researchers who are working with the material, particularly um, when you're working with materials um, that are outside of the country that you are currently in the responsibility um, to the national communities um, within the country of their origin. Um, so again, um, I think my contact information was there. I, I have just very recently taken over um, 
uh, responsibility for this curatorial area within Spencer Research Library, and it, it may go to someone else soon, but reach out. Um, I, I, I think we are very eager to know um, where and how we might uh, facilitate research with this material um, and, and which directions will um, push us most in, uh, in a way of service um, for, for scholarship and for um, research. Uh, with Onicha market literature. Okay, thank you so much to everybody. It's been really wonderful to hear your thoughts and engage today. This has been a, a lovely panel. Um, I just wanna close by saying that we all know how fortunate we are, right? To have this marvel at our universities. Um, I know I was thrilled to see the use on campus. One day I went in to consult the collection of, for the digitizing effort and I was told I couldn't see it. Um, it's because, you know, a whole class was using the collection at the time. So I just thought that was great because, um, you know, you don't always see large groups of people in the special collections areas. Um, we've also seen the usage from the digital versions, right, that are available on the internet as open source. And, and that's certainly a priority and very important. So I think we will continue to um, ponder how we can be good stewards of these gems that we have and think about what's next moving forward. So definitely continue the conversation in other venues and look forward to welcoming some of you to Kansas and welcome you back to Kansas in person when it's safe to do so. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, have a good day, stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye everyone, thanks.